So the prophet of Isaiah. Now, one of the things that uh, we're going to shift in themes, the, the, the shift in themes from the first 39 chapters to the last 27 is so dramatic, that leads to some heresies, the idea that it really was to Isaiah is a very popular theme among some people. But the shift in theme certainly does justify a change in style. And we're beneficiaries of a proprietary translation of the Great Scroll, which was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, by Dr. Uh, Peter Flint himself. And uh, so, in, in fact, his, that uh, translation from the Paleo-Hebrew into English is a, pro is a proprietary product of the International Standard Version Bible. So the ISV, leaning on uh, the proprietary translation by Dr. Peter Flint of Isaiah, he, they relegate the Masoretic text and the Septuagint to variants. They lean primarily on the Dead Sea Scrolls as their authority here. And uh, so we will, uh, as we has been our style here, we'll look at the ISV first to get the flavor because they do a wonderful job at the flow. And yet we'll confine our expositional comments uh, on the our more familiar King James. So that will be our style as we go here. But I'd like you to get a feeling for the timing here. If we look at the Old Testament manuscripts, of course, the Masoretic text, which is what most people are leaning on for the Old Testament, uh, actually is a 9th century A.D. product. Uh, the Septuagint was a translation of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, as we think of it. It was done several centuries, in fact, almost three centuries before Christ's ministry. It's known as the Septuagint. And those are the two primary documents for most Bibles to, to lean on for the Old Testament. But by leaning on the Dead Sea Scrolls, we pick up a, you know, literally a, a, a more than almost 2,000 years advantage, if you will. Uh, and so, uh, so the D Dead Sea Scrolls is the primary foundation, and we're using the Masoretic and the Septuagint as uh, variant readings. And so one of the things that we talked about when we first undertook our, our study of Isaiah is the pseudo-scholarship that pervades many of the seminaries. And uh, I need to talk a little bit about this because I remember so vividly. I was in my teens and I was very excited about the Bible. I was collecting commentaries and getting into that. And I stumbled into these ideas that, well, there really were two Isaiahs, not one and, and, and all that stuff. And also the so-called documentary hypothesis on Genesis, the uh, J-E-D-P-Q, all that nonsense. And uh, so I never really bought into that, but I found that it really cooled my my uh, uh, interest and excitement about the Bible. I backed away from it a little bit. Didn't accept the, the other views, but it certainly dampened my enthusiasm. And so, uh, to Isaiah, some say three. This is what they taught me. And uh, just as there's a tradition that Isaiah was sawed in half, well, they certainly did that to his book by dividing it into two. And uh, so, one of the things that uh, I, I have to tell you, one of the most precious verses in the Bible for me was John, in John 12, because it just changed my whole, uh, it reignited my whole passion for the scripture. In John chapter 12, it mentions in verse 37, though he had done many miracles before them, yet he, they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now that turns out to be a quotation from what we know as Isaiah chapter 53. No problem. The next verse after chapter 38 is verse, th is, uh, after 38 is verse 39. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded the eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, or be converted, or, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. That occurs in Isaiah chapter 6. You realize that the, uh, the Gospel of John is recording from Isaiah 53, and then Isaiah 6, and I want to call your attention to verse 39. It's one of my favorite verses here. And that is, because that Isaiah said again. Notice what he's saying here. It's the same Isaiah that wrote chapter 6 and chapter 53. And on this verse alone, it shatters this heresy that's taught in most seminaries today of the Deuter Isaiah, that there's really more than one Isaiah. That's not biblical. And you can't imagine the comfort that that gave me, and it reignited my whole life. Uh, uh, I, I began to cast a suspicious attitude to the pseudo, what I call pseudo-scholarship that pervades so much of, uh, of academic Christianity. 
A single verse verifies that that Isaiah said again. Now there are 61 separated passages are quoted and referred to 85 times in the New Testament. We went through these in that initial introduction to Isaiah, but I want it refreshed in our minds because we've just entered, we're going to be entering chapter 40, which is in the minds of many a different Isaiah. Not so. Isaiah 1 has all these things and we've, that we've seen already going in the first unit. In what I call Isaiah 2, the second unit, we find, we're going to find all kinds of messianic things. We'll take them as they come. And uh, they're just precious. Jesus himself quotes from Isaiah 29 and Mark 7. And then he also quotes from Isaiah 50, 42. You see, I, Jesus himself makes that bridge for us. It's a little, takes a little more uh, uh, putting together to understand that. And so that uh, Isaiah is referenced again and again as a single Isaiah. Ten times in Isaiah 1. And... Uh, and then there's 11 times for Isaiah 2, as I'll call it. And again, uh, it's, it, it bridges the entire New Testament. It's clear that, the, that this uh, Isaiah thing is, 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 in my mind, nonsense. We find six different speakers quote Isaiah. Uh, Christ, Matthew, Luke, John, John Baptist, and Paul uh, quote from both 1 and 2, if you will, as the s same Isaiah. And the manuscript evidence is important here. That's the strong and important evidence for Jesus' claims to be God. Isaiah's writings were completed many centuries before Jesus Christ was born, and yet uh, they prove completely accurate. Now here's the key fact that I think is interesting. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain more than one complete scroll of this book composed well before the birth of Christ. And the, the book of Isaiah was included in the Septuagint. That was three centuries before Christ was born, and, and it was translated over a 300-year period. But here's the key thing to keep in mind. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain a complete scroll of Isaiah dated from the 2nd century B.C. Now what's interesting here, the book is one unit. The end of chapter 39 and the beginning of chapter 40 are in a single column in the text. And that's, that goes way back. This demonstrates that the scribes who copied the scroll never doubted the singular unity of the book. Neither did the New Testament authors nor the early church, as quotations, both sections are attributed only to Isaiah. We're entering unit two. The first 39 chapters were full of judgment and judgment and judgment. We're going to see a whole shift in style as well as theme here. In verses, chapters 40 through 48, we're going to see the purpose of the peace of God. In chapters 49 to 57, we'll see the prince of that peace, which of course is our Lord Jesus Christ. And from chapters 58 to 66, we'll see the program. We're going to see the end time scenario. We're going to learn up things about Armageddon you may never have noticed, and so on. And you'll notice also the design of this, that the Prince of Peace is bracketed by a phrase, there is no peace, saith Yodhivave, to the wicked. And that's, that's at the end of 48, and it's also at the end of, I mean, just before the 49, and it'll be at the end of 57. But then right in the middle of the second unit, there's chapter, 53. We'll spend obviously some substantial time on that because it is considered by many as the, of, as the holy of holies of the Old Testament. In fact, when you study this carefully, you'll discover that it's 13 chapters into the unit and there's 13 chapters and it's literally mechanically in the middle. I think that's interesting. And so we, we, we need to be sensitive to the design of the, the book. It's amazing to me how many people who dwell on the so-called Deuter-Isaiah thing miss the structure, the architecture, of our designer. And so the, I think that's it's, it's interesting. Well, let's just jump in. We'll, the way we'll do this, as is our style, we'll read a segment from the ISV to get that flavor, and then we'll look at the expository notes from the King James. So... Starting in chapter 40, verse 1, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her heavy service has been completed, that her penalty has been paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, and in the desert a straight highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill shall be lowered, the rough ground shall become level, the high mountain ridges made a plain, and then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all humanity will see it at once, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. These four verses lay out the profile for the whole flavor of the last 27 books of Isaiah. And uh, it's uh, so the, the first two verses give us the keynote for the whole second part of the prophecy. 
And the great theme of the section we're moving into is Jesus Christ and specifically in his sufferings. We're going to see him portrayed two ways as the suffering servant, and that's the main emphasis, but we also see him presented as the victorious conqueror at the end. So that led to the belief among many uh, Jewish perspectives that there are really two Messiahs they're looking for, the, suffer the, the Mashiach ben Yosef, the suffering servant, and the Mashiach ben David, the ruling, ruling king. And one of the insights that is cru crucial here is to realize those two Messiahs are the same guy in two, uh, two arrivals. And so we're going to see his sufferings emphasized, but also his Davidic kingdom will emerge here. And because Israel is to be regathered, converted, and made the center of a whole new social order when the kingdom set up. And that's all going to be laid out here for us. And so let's take a look at the King James, which may be more familiar to our ears, thanks to Handel and his fabulous music. But Isaiah 40, verse 1, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished and her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now that may strike as a strange phrase. It sounds like it's unfair. And there's uh, the double for all her sins. And uh, the truth of the matter is this is actually an idiom. It's a commercial idiom. It, the word ample is a better translation than double. Ample for our sins is, the, is, is a, a better linguistic treatment of that. And so, uh, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. It's interesting that all four Gospels quote verse 3, chapter 40, as applying to John the Baptist. All four Gospels tie verse 3 to John the Baptist. And uh, the voice of the Christ in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And, uh, and it continues, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain shall, and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places made plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Wow, okay, so that's pretty parallel between the King James and the ISV. Let's see how it goes on here under the next few verses. In the ISV, a voice says, cry out. So I ask, what am I to cry out? All humanity is grass and its loyalty is like the flowers of the field. Grass withers and flowers fade away when the Lord's breath blows on them. Surely the people are like grass. Grass withers and flowers fade away when the Lord's breath blows on them, but the word of the Lord our God will stand forever. So that's the flavor of the, the ISV. You get the flow of, of I think, uh, uh, the, the prophet's thoughts here. In the King James, it says, The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? The all flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord of our God shall stand forever. Pretty parallel, uh, no real insights there, I don't think, that are unique. But this whole idea that all flesh is grass is, of course, a, a, uh, in the sense that grass is transitory, is the concept there. Here today, gone tomorrow kind of thing. And that kind of symbolism also p pervades the book of Revelation, that idea. So, so the idiom, it's interesting to be sensitive how the Holy Spirit uses the same idioms, whether it's Isaiah here or John in the, in the, gosp in the uh, uh, book of Revelation. Moving to the next segment in the ISV. Climb up a high mountain, you messenger of good news to Zion. Lift up your voice and with strength, you messenger to Jerusalem. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Look, the Lord God comes with strength and his arm rules for him. Look, his reward is with him and his payment accompanies him. Like a shepherd, he tends his flock. He gathers the lambs in his arms, carries them close to his heart, and gently leads the mother their sheep. What the prophet is doing here is giving them comfort because they, are, they don't realize that they're going to be heading into very, very dark times. And we may miss the application here because the primary application is virtually a century later. So we read it with insight because we know the history that unfolded. We sometimes lose sight of the fact that he's presenting this w way in advance of that need. God is comforting them. Why? Because all the nations are getting terrified by a leader that's coming and they're, they're reflecting that by turning to their idols. And God is saying, don't ignore the idols. I'm your, the, the real God that's behind you. That's really what he's saying here. 
Let's look at the King James. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. So that's uh, some of that echoes from Handel's music in years. But clearly the King James and the ISV are pretty parallel. The ISV flows a little smoother, obviously. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. He shall gently lead those that are with young. And uh, here we have this idiom of the shepherd, a very familiar term to anyone that studied the Bible. We think right away of the shepherd psalms. There are three adjacent psalms. Psalm 22, the suffering savior. Uh, Psalm 23, the living shepherd. And Psalm 24, the exalted sovereign. These three psalms are known as the shepherd psalms. And their main message is echoed in the New Testament in the good shepherd passage of John 10, the great shepherd passage of Hebrews 13, and the chief shepherd passage in 1 Peter 5, and so on. So the shepherd idiom, again, is one of these things that we're very comfortable with. It pervades the whole scripture, not just Isaiah. Well, let's continue with the ISV, verse 12. Who has measured the waters of the sea in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens by the width of his hand? Who has enclosed the dust of the earth in a measuring bowl, or weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Notice in verse 12 the emphasis on quantitative measures. Not just being aware of the creation, but have you ever measured? It's all quantitative. Who has measured the waters of the sea, the hollow of his hand, uh, marked off the width of his hand? Who has closed the dust of the earth in a measuring bowl? Who weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? It continues, who has fathomed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he consult to enlighten and instruct him on the path of justice? Or who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of wisdom? These are challenges with just a tone of sarcasm in them, in my mind. And uh, look, the nations are like a drop in a bucket and are reckoned as dust on the scales. Look, he even lifts up his islands like powder. Lebanon would not provide enough fuel, nor are its animals enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are reckoned by him as nothing and chaos. Notice, not only is God being exalted here, but the... the, the, the contrasting his majesty with the futility of the nations. Because the nations are arming by, by upgrading their idols as if that's somehow going to protect them from what's coming. And what's coming he's going to describe here in a minute. To whom then will you compare me, the one who is God? Or to what image will you liken me? To an idol? A craftsman makes the image and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts silver chains. To the impoverished person he prepares an offering wood that won't rot, or the one that chooses a skilled craftsman and seeks to erect an idol that won't topple? See, looking at the idols is futile anyway. This point, look at the contrast is what it's suggesting. In the King James, you get the same flavor, maybe not the same flow exactly. In the King James, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, who meted out the heaven with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Pretty straightforward, same parallel here. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, has taught him. And so, by the way, this leads to another area that I won't derail our whole study getting in detail. But there is a, a, a concept in secular science known as the anthropic principle, or anthropic factors. As you attempt to build a model of what we think we understand about the universe, we discover there are all kinds of mathematical relationships. And each one is precisely the right value to permit life. There's a gravitational coupling, electromagnetic coupling, strong force and weak force couplings. There's a ratio of the electron to the proton mass in the atom. Uh, there's the, the Earth's distance from the sun. Using the other, if it gets a little closer, it's too hot. A little further away, it's too... It's exactly where it needs to be. Each one of these are precisely where they need to be. And if you change them in one part in over a billion, life's impossible. It's, start, and it's so startling, that's why they give it that whole principle, it's called the, it's, it's as if the universe is designed for man. Well, that's exactly what the Bible's been saying all along, of course. The Earth's rotation period is exactly the right speed. It was faster or slower, life can't exist. And all of this is analyzed in, in our uh, briefing package called Beyond Coincidence. If you haven't seen that, or a book that we did with uh, Roger Oakman called Creator, or Mark Eastman, uh, Creator Beyond Time and Space. 
surface gravity is just the right amount. The thickness of the Earth's crust, strange enough, is exactly the right amount. The actual tilt, the 23 and a half degrees, turns out to be crucial. The albedo, the reflectivity of the Earth, is right between a greenhouse effect on the one hand or an ice age on the other. If it was, if it was just a little bit different, there'd be problems. The Earth's magnetic field is very, very delicate. The ozone level, I love this one because we have all the ecologists saying, gee, you know, if there's, if there's a, a, a tenth of a percent change in the ozone, it's going to be cosmic destiny. Well, wait a minute, stop and think for a minute. That raises two questions. Who balanced it in the first place? And who has maintained that? Each one of these is not only originally that way, each one of these things has to be maintained to make life go on. And that's all ignored by a lot of nonsense. So uh, people's thinking. The CO2 and water vapor levels are all, there's over a hundred of these and we deal with many of them in our briefing package separately. So that's sort of the flavor of what the, what the uh, prophet is raising here. He goes on, with whom took he a counsel? Who instructed him and taught him the path of judgment? And taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing, and vanity. And uh, to whom will the, ye liken God? What likeness will ye compare unto him? I <laughs> like that. They are as nothing. They're less than nothing. A friend of mine said, that's like a, you, you are zero with the rim rubbed out. <laughs> less than no, how do you get less than nothing? Is, the, is it's, in, it's an interesting use of phrase. The workman melteth a graven image, and goldsmith spreadeth over with gold, and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooses the tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. See that he's putting his he's putting his hope in vanity, in other words. But let's move on here. The majesty of the Lord is contrasted here. You know, don't you? You have heard, haven't you? Hasn't it been told you from the beginning? Haven't you understood from the foundations of the earth? He is the one that sits above the disk of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He's the one who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in. He brings princes to nothing, and makes void the rulers of the earth. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they have their stems taken root in the earth, then he blows on them, and they wither, and the tempest sweeps them away like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, and to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes up to heaven, and see who created all these, the one who leads out their vast array of stars by number, calling them all by name, because of his great might and his powerful strength, not one is missing." Wow, you, know, you look at the stars, you know there's billions and billions. Can you imagine naming all of them? He calls them all by name. It says so here and also in the Psalms. Let's look at the King James and see it. It says about pretty much the same thing. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. You know, this language may be so familiar to us, that if you read your Bible, but let's stop and think about it for a minute. It's he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. That's interesting. The round earth, there it is. And uh, he stretches out the heavens as a curtain. Now this little phrase is just pregnant with insight, if we look at it carefully. And I want, just to refresh your memory on a few things here, this is more than a metaphor. Who alone stretches out the heavens in Job, stretching out the heaven like a tent curtain in Psalm 104, stretching out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them out like a tent dwell in Psalm in Isaiah 40 here. He has stretched out the heavens in Jeremiah 10. The Lord who stretched out the heavens in Zechariah 12. Notice this idiom is used by the Holy Spirit in Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all through the scripture. In fact, I could go through and give you dozens of these. The main point here, there's another notion you need to be aware of. Space, as we think of it, is not an empty vacuum. We live in the space age, we think, from NASA and all that, but we're probably more ignorant here than we have any capacity to understand. Because the scripture tells us that space can be torn. In Isaiah 64, we'll run into that. It can be worn out like a garment, in Psalm 102. It can be shaken in Hebrews and Haggai and Isaiah. Space can be shaken, really? Yeah. It can be burnt up in 2 Peter 3. 
Here's the interesting one in Revelation 6. It can split apart like a scroll. Now that phrase is pregnant with insights. Why? See, it could be rolled up like a mantle or a scroll. Now do you need to understand, to be rolled up implies that there's an additional spatial dimension needed. There must be some dimension in which space must be thin to be rolled up. Space can be bent, apparently. Sp there is a direction that it can be bent toward. And so all this implies that there are additional spatial dimensions than that we, and the scientists now tell us that 10 is a very popular estimate. We don't think of that. We think of space as three-dimensional. No, it's apparently uh, ten-dimensional, maybe more. So let's go on here with Isaiah, at verse 23. That bringeth the princes to nothing, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. He shall also blow on them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom will ye liken me, and shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Calleth all by names. That's interesting. Psalm 147 makes that same remark. That he actually calls them by name. That's amazing to me. Well, continuing. Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you complain? My predicament is hidden from the Lord, and my cause is ignored by my God. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is eternal God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not go tired or weary, and his understanding cannot be fathomed. He is the one who gives might to the faint, renewing strength for the powerless. Even boys grow tired and weary, and young men collapse and fail. But those who keep waiting on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not grow tired. Well, all that's pretty familiar, even in the King, uh, ISV isn't that different than the King James here, really. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord? My judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is worry, there is no searching of his understanding. Each one of these passages hardly requires any exposition. It's pretty straightforward. It's easy to take any one of these verses, and we could spend an hour preaching from them. But the exposition is so straightforward. But there's a couple of subtleties I'd like to highlight here. What sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest thou, O Israel? You may recall, of course, that Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And usually in the Bible, when someone's name is changed, it stays changed. Abraham becomes Abraham. Sarai becomes Sarah. And it's that way all the way through. With Jacob, we find that throughout the Bible, sometimes he's called Jacob, and sometimes he's called by his new name, Israel. And what we notice, if we look at those passages, when he is in the flesh, he is called Jacob. When he is showing relatively rare moments of spirituality, he's called Israel. In other words, there's the name that's used is, is, is in, in parallel there. Okay. He giveth power to the faint, to them who have no uh, might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But here, verse 31 is that oft-quoted verse. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I've always been intrigued with that verse. It's so quoted so often, but you notice that it would not seem like it's in climactic order. It actually is. See, it's one thing to run and not be weary. But it's quite another that you walk and not faint. The ultimate test is finishing well. And sometimes the, the uh, accoutrement of being able to continue walking and not faint may be more a dramatic uh, uh, aspect than the sprint, in the, uh, the sprint at the beginning. But uh, anyway, I think I've always been intrigued with that, that it's not, it's, it's not the usual climactic order the real, the real test for all of us is endurance, the endurance of our walk. But we'll move on here. Let's take a look at the next chapter, where the Lord comes as a judge in the ISV. Be silent before me, you coastlands, and let them people renew their strength. Let them come forward. Then let them speak together. Let us draw near for a ruling. Who has aroused victory from the east, and has summoned it to his service, 
and has handed over nations to him? Who brings down kings and turns them into dust with his sword, into wind-blown stubble with his bow? And who pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path that his feet don't know? It's introducing a leader that's causing quite a stir. Now in the ISV, this is, they just leave it that way. In the King James, there's a, another inference implied. And I'll get into that as we go into the ISV, into the uh, King James Version. Who has performed and carried this out, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and will be with the last. I am the one. That's in the ISV. Let's take a look at it in the more familiar, perhaps, uh, King James. Keep silence before me, O islands. Let the people renew their strength. Let them come near. Let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. It's calling like a trial, see. Who has raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings? He gave them as the dust to his sword, and as driven stubble to his bow. This is a man of mystery, by the way. In the uh, ISV translation, they left it alone, but I would be remiss to you as an expositor pointing out that most of the reliable expositors recognize this is an, an advanced echo of something coming, namely the rise of Cyrus. One of the things the next few chapters are going to deal with the rise of Cyrus the Great. Now what makes this so fascinating, the, the whole saga of Cyrus is so dramatic, I'll leave most of that for, for those chapters that will focus on it, but once you know that's coming, this appears pretty clearly as a pre-echo of that forthcoming. Who has raised the righteous man from the... You see, Cyrus is a very strange guy, he's a, he's a Gentile ruler that God calls his anointed. Strange word for God to use of a Gentile leader. And there is a way that many people miss, but there is a way, in a sense, that Cyrus is looked upon as a type of Christ, as an advance, because just as he is a leader bringing an empire, Christ is also going to do that. And there are, strangely, some parallels there. So I don't want to oversell it. I want just you to alert yourself to the use of Cyrus as an idiom in the scripture here. Who has raised up the righteous man from the east? And, uh, you know, Cyrus is, Cyrus is called from the east in verse 2, and he's also from the north in verse 25. We'll get back to that later. Called him to his foot, gave the nations before him. Nations fell before him, quickly. Who gave them? See, God is behind it, is the point. One of the points that the prophet Isaiah is going to make is that since God has established Cyrus, that means it's going to be for good, not evil. So... Called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword, and driven stubble to his bow. The right, righteous man to be. So I'm going to suggest to you to just recognize this may be an advanced hint of Cyrus, which is going to be big. To, when, when you get to the last verse of chapter 44, and from there on, you're going to discover that Cyrus has a letter written to him by name where God says, I've surnamed thee. That letter was written 150 years before Cyrus was born. And when Cyrus encounters that letter, he changes history, and we'll talk about that. that he himself documents that in evidence that is in the London Museum. You can watch today, and we'll have a replica here for that. we we'll look at that when we get to that. Let's move on here, verse 3. He pursued them, and he passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? See, who has actually empowered Cyrus? God is behind it. That's his point here. I, the Lord, the first and, the, and with the last, I am he. See this phrase in verse 4. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. Where God says, I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. That phrase is a very useful thing you might want to mark in your Bible. And I put it underneath here. Because you'll find this in ver, uh, chapter 41, verse 4. And what I encourage you to do if you get uh, uh, addressed by a Jehovah's Witness is trying to attack Christ as God, you take them to, in their Bible if you like, Isaiah 41.4 and say, okay, who is this? He says, I the Lord of the first last, who is that? The, old, the Jehovah's Witness say, well, that's, Je that's Jehovah God. Then you go to Isaiah 44 verse 6. You got a similar phrase. You do the same thing again. You ask them, who is that? Well, that's Jehovah God. 
You go down to verse 8 of that chapter. Same phrase again. Who is that? By now they're wondering, what are you getting at? It, 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 there it is. Then you take to Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Who is that? They say, well, that's Jehovah God. And so you get to chapter, uh, verse 17, same thing. Then you go to uh, Revelation 22, 13, same thing. I am the first and the last. Who is that? Once they've gotten, you've gotten them to agree that that's the one they call Jehovah God, you then take them to Revelation 2, verse 8, where he says, I am the first and the last who was dead and is alive and remain forever. Amen. So in other words, you suddenly realize that the person in the Trinity, that's God, became man and died. You follow me? If you link those together, they're a useful chain in the margin of your Bible, if you like, because that's a, a path uh, that can be useful to, to recognize the reality that Jesus is not only God, he's also man. Both pieces are essential. Both pieces are, uh, both aspects are critical for what it's worth. Well, let's move on here. I just thought that would be worth putting in your notes because I find that a useful chain to have in the back of your Bible to, uh, to go down step by step. And when you do that, leave the Revelation 2, 8, one last because that's your punchline, if you will. Cyrus the Great. The first four verses of this chapter really are alluding to victories and the rapid growth that he achieved, but it's being attributed to God. It's God's handiwork. Verses 5 through 7 are the effect upon the nation. The nations are responding to the rise of Cyrus by uh, you know, upgrading their idols. Wrong approach. Verses 8 through 20, the, uh, Isaiah is pointing out that since he was raised by God, Israel should expect good, not evil. And the last few verses is a contemptuous challenge to the idols the nations are trusting. See, this whole thing comes up because God is disparaging them, that the, you know, the, the Gentile nations around them are trembling because they're trusting in their idols. And God is saying, you know, I'm the living God, I'm looking out for you guys. That's what he's really, in effect, in my mind, saying here. Well, let's go on to see how the ISV treats the verse 5. The coastlands have looked and are afraid. The ends of the earth have drawn to get near together and come forward. Each helps his neighbor, saying to each other, be strong. The craftsman encourages the goldsmith, and the hammersmith encourages the one who strikes the anvil. He says about the welding, it's good, and reinforces it with nails so it won't topple. In other words, they're improving the craftsmanship of their idols as their response. That's the, what they're trusting in. That's the point. Well, the King James, the, the isle saw it and feared the ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. They helped everyone, his neighbor, everyone said to his brother, be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith and he that smoothed the hammer, him that smote the anvil, saying, it is ready for soldering. And he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved. But in the ISV continuing in verse 8, but as for you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the offspring of my friend Abraham, you whom I encouraged from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners and told you. You're my servant. I've chosen you and haven't cast you aside. Don't be afraid because I'm with you. Don't be anxious because I am your God. I keep on strengthening you. I'm truly helping you. I'm surely holding you with my victorious right hand. Hallelujah, Hallelujah is right. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it's in the, you take the King James from verse 8. And thou, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Now, there's that interesting phrase, Abraham, my friend. Um, because that is, the, we've, Abraham, one of his titles, unique labels, is that he was considered a friend of God. It's not only here in Isaiah 41. It was in Second Chronicles 20, verse 7, and James the Lord's half-brother writes in his epistle that Abraham is a friend of God. That's where it comes from. And uh, when you study that, you'll also discover that friendship is considered uh, a, a, a license for prophetic insight. Even Jesus, when he called in his upper room discourse, tells his disciples, I, I, hence you've been my servants, from now you're my friends. Shall I? And he goes on to tell them what's coming, where he announces the rapture and all of that in chapter 14 of John. So, and the ultimate example of that is Beloved. And the Beloved, uh, uh, John, John the Beloved, well, uh, uh, Daniel was known as the, the, the prophet that was Beloved. If you look at the prophets, the one that was called the Beloved Prophet was Daniel. And he, of course, is the apocalyptic prophet. And you look at the disciples, 
John was the beloved disciple. And who wrote the book of Revelation? John did. So the beloved label seems to link with a, a license for apocalyptic insights. But moving on here. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. I want to point that out. One of the heresies that pervades the organized Christian church is this idea that the church somehow has replaced Israel, that Israel has been cast away. Not so. That's, a, that's, a, that's not true. And uh, you can chase that uh, very easily by God has not cast off Israel because uh, uh, you get Romans chapter, uh, Paul in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine called the Epistle of the Romans hammers away in chapter 8, 9, and 10 uh, on that whole issue. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not be dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I want you to notice that my righteousness, it's God's righteousness, not ours, that's at issue here. A small point, but a critical one. Let's go ahead and look at verse 11 in the ISV. Look, all you who are enraged at you will be put to shame and disgrace. Those who contend with you will all die. Those who quarrel with you will be as nothing. Those who fight you like nothing at all. And... uh, uh, the uh, King James, pretty much the same thing. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them, even them that contend with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing, as a thing of naught. And uh, so this, of course, is all echoes, if you will, of Genesis 12.3, the unconditional covenant with Abraham, in effect, being underscored here. Back to the ISV, verse 13, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Don't be afraid, I'll help you. Don't be afraid, you little worm Jacob and you insects of Israel. I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, the men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The Lord thy Redeemer. It's interesting, it sounds like more than one, doesn't it? The Redeemer, the Goel, if you will, the kinsman Redeemer, from Ruth and uh, Revelation, the book of Ruth and Revelation chapter 5 is your background to really get into that if you haven't done that before. And uh, so we could get into the whole Avenger of Blood thing and so forth, but let's just keep moving here. The Holy One of Israel, by the way, appears seven times in these chapters. It's a very, very key uh, theme here. Getting back to the ISV, see, I am making you a new sharp and multi-tooth thrashing sledge. You will thrash and crush the mountains and make the hills like chaff. You will winnow them, and the wind will lift them up, and a tempest will blow them away. Then you will rejoice in the Lord, and you will make your boast in the Holy One of Israel. Wow, that's a graphic way of describing it, isn't it? We make you a new sharp multi tooth thrashing sledge. And you, you'll thrash and crush the mountains and make the. It's like chaff. Uh, verse 17 As for the poor, the needy, those seeking water, when there is none and their tongues are parched from thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, won't abandon them. I'll open up the rivers on the barren heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I'll turn the desert into a pool of water and the parched land into springs of water. I'll put cedar trees in the wilderness along with acacia, myrtle, and olive trees. I'll plant cypresses in the desert, box trees and pine trees together so that the people may see and recognize and perceive and consider and comprehend at the same time that the hand of the Lord has done this and that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Wow, strong language. King James is pretty straightforward. Behold, I'll make thee a sharp, a new sharp thrashing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thrash the mountains and beat them small and, and, uh, and shalt make them the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them and the wind shall carry them away and the whirlwind shall scatter them and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and the needy seek water, there's none, and their tongue fails for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. 
I will open the rivers and high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Very parallel all the way through here. No profound insights really. There's a few here though. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shittas tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. And I will set in the desert the fir tree, the pine, and the box tree together. And they may, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Some of the uh, uh, more profound expositors point out that the trees that are listed here are trees that were indigenous to, to Israel. In the writings of after the return from Babylon, they find trees mentioned that were not indigenous to Judah. The fact there's none of those trees mentioned here is regarded as evidence that this document precedes the Babylonian captivity. A subtlety, but a, an interesting one for what it's worth. And so, so the uh, use of these trees demonst helps demonstrate the timing of the book as being prior to the Babylonian captivity is the idea there. Okay, let's move on. Verse 21 in the ISV. Put forward your case, says the Lord. Submit your arguments, says Jacob's king. Let them approach and ask us what will happen. As to the former things, what were they? Tell us so that we may consider them and know. Or the latter things, or the things to come, let us, near, let us hear. Tell us what the future holds, so that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do something good or something bad, so that we may hear and gaze at it together. See the sarcastic challenge that God is throwing to them if they're, if they, if they're worshiping these gods. Let's tell, let them tell what's coming. Look you and your work are less than nothing. Whoever finds you pleasing is disgusting. <laughs> you are stirring up one from the north, and they are coming from the rising of the sun, and he will be called by his name. Rulers will arrive like mud, just like the potter. He will trample the clay. Who told, of, who told of this from the beginning? So we could know, or beforehand, so we could ask, is it right? Indeed, no one told of this. No one made an announcement, and no one heard your words. First to Zion there is slumber, and then to Jerusalem I'll send a messenger with good news. But when I look, there is no one. Among them there's no one to give counsel. There's no one to give an answer when I ask them. See, none of them exist, and their deeds are nothing. Their metal images are only wind and confusion. <laughs> this is where the ISV seems to flow more, more graphically, but let's take a look at the King James. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the King of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, and declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are God. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed or behold it together. Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work of naught. An abomination is he that chooses you. <laughs> okay. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as a potter treadeth the clay. He shall call upon my name. Wow. By the way, Cyrus does come from the northeast, by the way. So he said it's coming from the east in verse 2, but from the north here in verse 25. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know, and before time that we may say, He is righteous? Yea, there is none that showeth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth your words. The first shall say unto Zion, Behold, behold them. And I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. For I beheld, and there was no man even among them. There was no counselor that when I asked of them could answer a word. Behold, they are all vanity. Their words are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. Okay. Well, let's uh, take a another short chapter here to keep the mo momentum here. And this is focusing, this is the first of several chapters focusing on Christ himself as the serpent. And I'll tie in, I'll tie in the Cyrus factor when we get to the, the chapter uh, 44 and 45. So let's l table that for the moment. Here is my servant whom I support, my chosen one in whom I delight. I placed my spirit upon him and he'll deliver his justice throughout the world. Wow. He won't shout or raise his voice or make it heard in the street. A crushed reed will he not break. A fading candle will he, he won't snuff out. He'll bring forth justice from, for the truth. And he won't grow faint or be crushed until he establishes justice on the mainland and the coastlands take ownership 
of his law. Wow. And so, uh, now those, those, incidentally, those first four verses are quoted in Matthew 12, just as they are, by the way. Let's look at how it is in King James. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom I, my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry or lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. My servant. See, this, is, this, is the, the, this is the title of Jesus Christ. We're going to see Jesus portrayed here, the Messiah portrayed in his servant role here. One of two presentations that will occur in, in the scripture. And uh, this is all uh, supported in the New Testament too. Uh, so, uh, utterly obedient servant, that's what John 4 and Hebrews 3 deal with. Upheld by the Father in John 5. Mine elect is determined by First Peter 2. My spirit is upon him, Luke 2, 3, 4. All through Luke, he hits that pretty hard. Okay. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment in, unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. That Bruce Reed phrase, I think you recall, was referred to Egypt by Sennacherib back there in, in chapter 36. We talked about that then. And again, uh, in Matthew 12, 17, following, there's th these verses are quoted, re referring to, of course, Jesus Christ. Continuing the ISV at verse 5, this is what God says, the God who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its produce, who gives breath to the people on it and life to those who walk in it. I've called you in righteousness. I'll take hold of your hand. I'll preserve you and appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light for the nations, to open blind eyes and to bring out those who are bound in their cells, who are and those sitting in darkness from prison. Wow. I, the Lord, am the one, and I won't give my name and glory to another, nor praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and I'm announcing the new things. Before they spring into being, I am telling you about them. In the King James, straightforward, Thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens and stretched them out. He spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, the spirit and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. I'll come back to that. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and to them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. A light of the Gentiles. That's one of his key roles, if you will. Let's take a look at that. It's the ultimate role for the Messiah. The light of the Gentiles. As the light, he brings salvation to the Gentiles. And Luke Chapter 2 and Acts 13, hammer on that. As the root of Jesse, he is to reign over the Gentiles in his kingdom. And that was, we saw that back in Isaiah 11, and it's also in Romans 15 and elsewhere. And for the believing Gentiles, together with the believing Jews, they'll constitute the church which is his body. So that's another, so we are his light, if you will, at this part of his program. The light of the Gentiles. Then he continues, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory. Will I not give to another, neither my praise to a great, to graven images? Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And we're going to have a lot of that in the rest of, this, the, rest of the book of Isaiah. Let's go look at the ISV in ten, verse 10. Sing to the Lord a new song in his praise from the ends of the earth. You who sail down the sea and by everything in it, you coastlands and their inhabitants, let the desert cry out, its towns and villages where Kedar lives, and let those who live in Selah sing for their joy. Let them shout aloud for the mountaintops. The Selah thing is something the ISV brings out. I'll come to that in a minute. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praises in the islands. The Lord marches out like a warrior. He stirs up his rage like a man of war. He makes his anger heard. He shouts loud. He declares his mastery over his enemies. I have certainly stayed silent for a long time. I have kept still and held myself back. Now, like a woman giving birth, I cry out. All of a sudden, I'll gasp and pant. I'll devastate the mountains and hills. I'll dry up all their vegetation. I'll turn rivers into islands and dry up the ponds. I'll help the blind walk, even on the road they do not know. I'll guide them in the directions they do not know. I'll turn the dark places into light in front of them and the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do, and I won't abandon them. 
Those who trust in carved idols will turn back and be completely disappointed, along with those who say to mental images, you are our gods. Well, that's <laughs> heavy stuff. Let's see how the King James teaches it. Sing unto the Lord a new song and His praise from the end of the earth, they that, ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar doth inhabit. Let the inhabitants of the rock sing, let them shout from the top of the mountains. Now the word rock here is that word Selah, which the king, which the ISV picks up as a location. And uh, the word actually can mean rock, it's Selah, it's actually another label for Petra. And that will have much more meaning to you when we get to Isaiah 63, as to the role, the peculiar role of Petra in the eschatological climax. But we'll leave it here for now just as a reminder. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare His praise in the islands. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against His enemies. And the islands is coastlands. It can be translated either way. And uh, I have a long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now I will cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste the mountains and hills. I will dry up all the herbs. I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. This is what's called by Joel and others the day of the Lord. It's coming. It's going to be a big sh surprise for everyone. And I'll bring the blind by the way they knew not. I will lead them in the paths that they have not known. I will make the darkness light before them and the crooked places straight, crook, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back and they shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images that say to the molten images, ye are our gods. So we're going to get a rebuke to Israel now from, from the Lord here. He says, listen, you deaf people. Look up, you blind people, so, as so you may see. Who is blind except my servant, or deaf like my messenger I am sending? Who is blind like the one committed to me, or blind like the Lord's servant? You have seen many things, but you pay no attention. Your ears are open, but he doesn't listen. The Lord was pleased for the sake of his vindication, that he should magnify his law and make it glorious. But this is a people who have been robbed and plundered, and all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. They have become prey, with no one to rescue them. They have been made loot, with no one to say, send them back. Who among you will listen, pay attention, and listen for the time to come? Well, in the King James, Hear ye deaf, and look ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind that he is, that is perfect, or blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey. And none delivereth for a spoil, and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Well, the ISV continues, And who handed Jacob over to looters and Israel to robbers? Was it not the Lord against whom ye, we have sinned? After all, they weren't willing to walk in his ways, and they wouldn't obey his instructions. So he drenched him with the heat that is his anger, the violence of war. It enveloped him in flames, but he had no insight. It burned him up, but he didn't take, to, take it to heart. And the King James who gave Jacob for a spoiler Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? Interesting term. We're the ones that have sinned. For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it hath set him on fire round about, yet he knew not. And it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. Wow. So chapter... Uh, 41 here is, uh, 42 is, is the beginning of a pair of chapters on his stewardship. So for the next session, what I'd like you to do is study chapters 43 and 44 to continue this thought. And uh, i also going to encourage you to find out what you can about the career of Cyrus the Great and the rise of the Persian Empire. We'll take that under advisement as that unfolds. It's going to be a very key, very surprising 
role in history and a very, very key event in your biblical studies. And so with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer.